we are reading from the book of Ecclesiastes this morning. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 37. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not preaching from Ecclesiastes. I'm from Ezekiel. So, so absent-minded this morning. Ezekiel, I should get that right. Uh, Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. Got that right, right? Uh, 37 verses 1 to 14. Let's read responsively from the Word of God. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. So he said to me, Prophesy for these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to the, these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a sound and behold a rattling and the bones came together bone to its bone. I looked and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it desire curse the Lord. Amen. Thank you for reading the long verses this morning from Ezekiel, right? Uh, I've uh, read this story from Chuck Swindoll, one of my uh, favorite preachers, and he tells of a story of a famous violinist. His name was Paganini uh, when he was performing in Italy. He was performing this beautiful piece with the orchestra accompanying him, with the grand audience, and Something incredible happened. One of his strong strings broke, right? Violin has four strings, FYI. One of them breaks, and people thought, what is he going to do? But he kept on playing with the, on the rest of the three strings. But believe it or not, another spring, string broke. And so he was left with uh, two, and he was still playing the entire piece on the two strings. And uh, most amazingly, another spring uh, broke. And people thought, surely Paganini will stop and go to the back and you know, redo his strings and maybe play it again. But uh, he paused a little bit and then he continued on the entire piece on one string. And that was Paganini. Um, and uh, after the concert was done, people were, were all were standing up, uh, uh, stand up, uh, 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 ovation and he was welcomed. His performance was cheered and appreciated all over Europe. 
as people of God, as children of God, we feel that sometimes our strings break one by one. The strings that we use to play the, the notes that God has given us, the music that we are meant to play, but the, thing, the strings that we rely upon each day, the string of health fails. The string of our relationships fails. The string of our um, stronghold, it fails. Our finances fails. And we are left with maybe one last string that we hold on to continue on the life of faith. As Christians, we do not lose hope because regardless of all, if all the strings are broken, all the things that we can see and feel, even though everything breaks, there is one string of hope that we always hang on to. And that is the power of our faith, the string of our faith. We feel like times in our lives when, when there's nothing to, to rely upon. There's no, nothing that could sustain us. We can be in a spiritual slump. We could go through suffering. We could go through, indeed, a dark night of the soul. But as Christians, we have a hope that we could hold on to. And that's really the, the uh, theme of my message this morning. What is the hope that we have? What is the source of our hope? that we can continue on even in the most devastating times, the dark times of our lives. And in the story of Ezekiel, we find at least two things, two hopes that we can hold on to as people of God. As we saw two weeks ago before the Thanksgiving Sunday, we saw that Israel, the people of Israel lost all hope, in fact, because the city was uh, ransacked, it was burnt. Remember the picture we saw on the screen of all the, the uh, city was burning up and the walls were de devastated, destroyed? They had lost the string of their king, uh, Jehoiakim. He was lost. He was taken into captive by the Babylonians. They lost the, the string of their land, their, their promised land was taken away. They had no land to live in. They were pulled out from their land. But there was still one string that they held on to until the very last moment of their nation. This was the string of the temple of God. Because surely this represents the identity, national identity that they had, the, the pride they had before God. No other nation in the world had the presence of the holy God. But only Jerusalem had the temple of God where God promised this presence. But as we know in history, BC 587, the city of Jerusalem falls, and with the fall, the temple itself is burnt up. The Solomon's temple is gone. The last string that they were holding on to is broken. The rest is history, right? So the, they are taken as captives into Babylon, and they are no longer Israel. They're no longer a people of God, they thought. But God works in the most mysterious ways, doesn't he? He raises one priest among the captive community, among the community of the captives. He raises a priest, like Jeremiah of, that we saw a couple of weeks ago, another priest by the name of Ezekiel, the, the very man who wrote this book. And he, God used him to speak to the exile, exilic community that were um, now in, uh, in exile in Babylon. And th God showed them what hope they could have, they had, as what they can hold on to in this most devastating time when they thought there was no hope. God shows this amazing vision, or maybe it was it's something that actually happened, we're not sure. But God takes Ezekiel to this valley, right? This valley of bones this valley of death. We can kind of assume that uh, maybe there was this battle, great battle, military battle in this valley long time ago, and uh, the defeated army, their bodies were just laid waste. And it had, time had passed, a long time had passed. How do we know? Because the, door, the bones were dried up. It was a big pile of bones, a big pile of human skeleton in this valley. And God shows Ezekiel this amazing sight, this valley, and he asks this question, another in, uh, amazing, uh, incredible question. He says, son of man, because that's what God used to call Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? Can these bones live? 
And I'm not sure what went through Ezekiel's mind. Is this a trick question by God? Is he kidding me? Can these bones live? You know, death. The significance of death is that there is no hope. Zero hope. No chance of any survival, any revival in this person if they're dead. You know, when our family member, you know, gets a stroke and they're in bedridden for the rest of their life or, you know, they're on life support, they need medical help, you still don't let them go because there are always medical miracles. As long as they have a pulse, as long as they have a heartbeat, we don't, go, we don't let go of, of the hope because there is always a, a possibility that they could be resuscitated, they could be, come back to life and live normal lives. So whether it be 10 years, 20 years, we hold on to our loved ones as long as they have the, the breath of life because there is hope. But if you're dead, no matter how you loved your family member, if they're dead, you bury them. There is no hope. There is zero percent that anything good will happen to that body. And God was asking Ezekiel, can these bones live? And so Ezekiel gives a wise answer. Oh Lord, I guess only you know. Because there was no hope. What does this vision mean? What did it mean for Israel and for us? It is lucky for us that God actually interprets this vision on behalf of us in verse 11. Look with me in verse 11. He says, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. And we, we are indeed cut off. This was the spiritual state. This was the mental state of the exilic community. They knew that they were lost. The temple is lost. Our nation is lost. We have no hope of becoming that holy nation, that priest nation that God had called us to be. And they, called, they saw themselves as dried up bones. We are being cut off from the covenant of God and there is zero percent of hope. We are indeed dead as a people. This was the self-image that the people of God had for themselves. And to these dry bones, God was commanding Ezekiel to testify, to prophesy. He says, prophesy over these bones. In verse 4 and 5, going back to verse 4 and 5, God commands Ezekiel to say, O dry bones, you shall live. O dry bones, you shall live. We need to note that this was not just a, you know, a wishful thinking, a word that uh, just came out of Ezekiel's mind, uh, mouth at, at random. It was a word that, was, that God told him to prophesy to speak forth. And God also gave the specific inst instructions what to say. That the sinews, the tendons, the muscles, and the skin will be covered. There will be flesh. And it should come back to life. And what's amazing is when Ezekiel actually obeyed the word of God. He prophesied to the bones and says, Oh dry bones, live. Suddenly there was this clattering sound, right? This rattling sound, as the Bible says in our ESV. And uh, suddenly there was movement and sound. Could you imagine what that must, must have been? I've never seen dry bones kind of come into place and becoming a person again. So it's really hard for me to imagine. But using my best imagination, what would that sound be like? I, I thought maybe it's like the tap dance sound, you know? Somebody tap dancing. And all this vibrance of, of life, it's uh, the animated, you know, the, the, this quiet valley is suddenly waking up with the sound of life coming together with, with flesh and skin and blood and there was a lot of excitement, a lot of energy in that once dead valley. Again, what does this mean? What did this mean for Israel? Verse 13 gives us an interpretation of what it meant. It was a, a, a vision into the future. Right now, you are like dead bones, dried up bones. But God will change that. And let's look at verse 13. Um, let me read it for us. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. It will be like somebody coming out from their coffin. 
you know, breaking out from the ground. And they're alive and they're animated. It's like you coming out from the grave. And the people of Israel, you are now dead in Babylon in captivity. You have no hope, zero hope. But one day, I will bring you out from captivity and send you back home. And you will be amazed. Because this reality, this prophecy was so incredible. God had to show a vision of these dry bones, the valley of dry bones for Ezekiel and for the community of Israel to, for them to fathom, to wrap their mind around the concept that God is somebody can bring hope in dry bones, bring life in these dead corpse, the skeleton. God was previewing them for what is about to happen. God knew that his people had no hope. Zero hope. And God was creating a hope. In fact, God, isn't that God's you know, specialty? He makes something out of nothing. He makes hope out of no hope. He makes life out of skeletons. God knew that they were people who could not escape their dead state. They were dead, in fact. When God spoke into their lives, they would be able to have hope. And they, they would hear the word of God through a prophecy through the prophet Isaiah. And even though they were dead, they could have life. And this was the hope that they could hold on to. In other words, what was the hope for Israel? The, the one hope that they still had was that God was still speaking to them. That the word of God, the power of God, the power of the word of God was living inside of them. That was the hope that they had. You know, our words don't mean much, right? We can say whatever you want. You know, I see a lot of that in politics. You know, they see, wow, so many things, rhetoric and whatever, and sometimes it has power, sometimes it doesn't, but most of the time it, doesn't has, it has no power. Our words are so light, and they could always change. But when God says something, it is powerful. It has created the heavens and earth. And when God tells Ezekiel to prophesy... His words, the prophecy is powerful. I want to focus on this word prophesy a little bit, for a little bit. Do you have the slide on there for us? Uh, this is from the dictionary and it says prophesy. What does it mean? To pour forth a flow of words under excitement of inspiration. Does it make sense? So in other words, your heart and your mind is is uh, you have received something. There's a substance, like a liquid. You've received something and you are just simply pouring that out. You're letting that flow out through you. And this pouring started with the excitement of inspiration, it says in the definition. It started with God. God gave us something, a word, His promise. And prophesying is nothing more than uh, laying that out, uh, lavishly giving out, Pouring out what God has given to us. Indeed, God had given Ezekiel a word of God. Not just this word, but to the people of Israel. He had spoken to Jeremiah and to Ezekiel. He said, after 70 years, I will bring you back out from Babylon, back to your homeland. All the people of God had forgotten. They thought all hope was lost. It's all lost cause. God never forgets his promise. And so God had poured out his word upon Ezekiel to prophesy and say, O oh, dry bones, live. That's what he meant. He was going to bring them out from this captivity. He was going to give them an amazing resurrection. And when they see this amazing miracle happen in Israel, they will see and experience God. You will know that I am God. Again, our words have little power. But the word of God is powerful. And when we prophesy, when we pour out God's word, it comes back as a miracle. I've read a mission story of uh, a, a, some missionaries from Denmark uh, being sent to Greenland. Can you show us the map? We all know where that is, but just to remind ourselves, you know, there are these brothers, Moravian brothers, this church, 
uh, they wanted to share the gospel to the natives in Greenland back in the 17, late 1700s, early 1800s. And uh, they went on a mission trip. They want, went on a mission cause to convert the, the natives there, the Indians there. And so they came up with a strategy. They thought, they said, that uh, these natives are so uh, superstitious. There's a lot of, you know, mysticism in, our, in their religion. We need to educate them first before they can hear the word of God. So they've invested a lot of education, a lot of education efforts for 17 years. And after 17 years, there was one convert, one person that believed in Christ. Such a, such a tremendous investment and so little gain, so little fruit that uh, the missionaries, the Moravian brothers, were very discouraged. Until one day, a, a man, a native man by the name of uh, Kai Yarnak, Kai Yarnak, uh, it's a Greenland name, I guess, uh, Kai Yarnak, he he came to the missionary's home. The missionary's name was Beck, Mr. Beck. He was in the process of translating the New Testament into the people's language. And uh, he was reading what he had translated. And he was reading the last part of the life of Jesus in Matthew, of his suffering of the cross of Jesus' sacrifice. And uh, Yarnak, uh, Kar Yarnak heard this, and he understood and he got a glimpse of what the story was about, that Jesus died for our sins. And when we just believe in Jesus Christ, that we will be saved. He wants to know more about this. So he asked this question to the missionary. He says, how is that? Tell me once more. I too want to be saved. This was an amazing moment, a breakthrough for Beck and also the missionaries, the Moravian brothers there. And... Uh, Kari Yarnak became a Christian. He and his family were baptized. They became a Christian. And they were, they actually, they became a pastor. He became a pastor and uh, set the first church, planted the first church of Greenland. Well, after Mr. Uh, Karyak, Karnyak, uh, he became a pastor. He confessed, he taught the missionary and said, uh, Mr. Missionary, if you want to do missions here, if you want to share the gospel here, don't focus on the human logic. Tell them, tell us the gospel story. That's what makes a difference. Yes, when we think there is no hope in our lives, we must go back to the old story of the cross. How Jesus has saved us from our sins. That is the most powerful story. That is the powerful message that Jesus has given, God has given to all of us. In a world where there is no hope, that God has sent a Savior, God has sent Jesus as his Messiah, as the promised one, to deliver us, forgive us from all our sins, and to give eternal life. That is the message that is powerful, that changes lives, that makes a difference. When we embrace that story, when we embrace the Word of God, our lives are forever changed. Why has God put this chapter 37 into the Bible and let us hear this morning what is what is God, God wanting us to do I want to have one application let us hope in the prophecy of the word let us hope in the prophecy of the word for ourselves for our lives brothers and sisters how are you in the morning when you, grow, when you get up you know in the morning I'm usually grouchy I'm usually not very happy and very you know um, sad and depressed. That's my human nature. I say, what hope is there today? Today will be like yesterday, if not worse. And that's my human nature. And when I fill my heart, my mind, and my soul with the Word of God, and it illuminates who God is and what He has said, suddenly I have hope. Suddenly I have this strength to live each day. Are we waking up to our Facebook post, Instagram, our emails, notification, Kakao Talk? Or do we want to fill our mornings with the prophecy of the Word of God? Prophesy to yourself the Word of God. Our hearts are usually like dry bones. God, I am so dry. I am so desperate. I have no hope for today. But prophesy to yourself the gospel message when that happens. 
your heart will, will clatter, it'll top dance in fact, and be uh, animated to live the life that God has called you to live. Um, we don't read the Bible not necessarily just for, for information, right? To know what God did 2,000 years ago for us, 2,500 years ago for us. We actually know, you've read the Bible many, many times, but why do we uh, digest, why do we intake the Word of God and let that Word prophesy to us? It's because it becomes our strength. It becomes our energy, in fact. I know uh, many of you had, maybe all of us had turkey, you know, last Sunday. Do you really enjoy turkey that much? I'm kind of asking a doubtful matter, so I guess you, I'm expecting the answer to be no, right? I don't enjoy turkey that much, but, you know, it's a treat. You know, it's something delicious for the occasion. And it's good. But we go back to our, you know, Kimchi chige for some of you. We go back to our spaghetti and pasta and our pizzas and hamburgers and, you know, rice. Because although it's nothing new, that gives us strength. That gives us the energy to live each day. Although this word of God is not new, once it is prophesied into our hearts, into our minds, into our souls, it becomes power. The word of God, in fact, is powerful. And only when we prophesy to ourselves this word, we can live each day as God has planned us to live. I have a very specific application, in fact. You know, many of you I know are doing the daily quiet time. It's also in your bulletins, you know, each week, each day, for each day. And there's a book, actually, we're selling um, uh, every year about this time. And uh, I know our English side hasn't been buying the uh, QT books that much, but next year we will venture more into family quiet time and trying to prophesy not only to ourselves but to our family members, to our children, to our next generation as you lead the worship uh, every week. And uh, I encourage you if you haven't to be able to buy these, purchase these QT books so that we would always be able to prophesy, hear the word of God for ourselves in the morning. Uh, let's just read with one verse, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, reminding ourselves uh, how we have strength in the Lord. Let's read it together. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. One more time. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Amen. When we replenish our souls with our, e our ears and our hearts with the word of God, especially the word of Christ, that becomes, becomes faith for us to live a new day, uh, a challenging day, and have hope in the most hopeless situations. What is the anchor of our hope? It is the power of God, Word of God. And secondly, we have another source of hope alongside the Word of God. Um, Isaiah, God, God tells Ezekiel to prophesy once more, in fact, in verse 9. Look at me in verse 9. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. You see, they were like, to describe, maybe like zombies. There was no, you know, breath of life. They were just flesh and bone. They were not living. They, they had uh, energy, but there was no life, breath of life. So he had to prophesy once again, saying that, breathe, O oh, breath of God, come and fill these people. And only then were they, were they able to become an army of God and be able to do the mission that they had from God. What does this mean in history? What did God mean as he showed this vision to Ezekiel and to us? Again, verse 14, the last verse that we read this morning, uh, interprets what it means. 14 says, And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. God knew if they were just to go back to the land of, Egypt, uh, land of Israel, to Palestine, to the whole promised land, that they will, after many years, they'll be right back in Babylon where they were right now. Because God knew that they did not have the capability to follow God's plan, to live out the nation, priesthood nation of God. They did not have their desire to live a holy life as a people of God because they were spiritually dead. God was 
going to blow in them, breathe in them the very Spirit of God. And when did this happen? We know that this happened on the day of Pentecost, right? When the disciples were praying, the 120 disciples were praying, and the Spirit of God dwelt, came upon the people there so they could live as people of God. In fact, the Holy Spirit is a helper. He is a one who gives us energy and gives us the power to live as the people of God. Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Right? He is God. And he is, he is the most powerful being in First. this universe. How do we know? Because the Bible tells us that after Jesus died on the cross, he was put into the grave for three days, right? And it was to prove that he didn't faint. It was just not a you know, collapse. He actually was dead. You know, no hope whatsoever of life. It was the Holy Spirit that raised him up after three days and proclaimed this person to be the Son of God. And the Bible says that same Holy Spirit is in all of us who believe, profess that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit, that, that powerful Spirit is working within us. If that Spirit works within us, isn't that enough hope? for us to live each day, regardless of whether all our other strings are, are torn and broken to pieces. If we have that hope in the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, isn't that, the, is that, isn't that enough for us to live each day as people of God? The Holy Spirit, when He works in our lives, He gives us the choice. He gives us the power to live, to choose God's way in our lives. When the Holy Spirit leads us, He leads us to the way of life. If we did not have the Holy Spirit, we would be good as dead. We would be existing as flesh and bone, but no purpose, no meaning, no desire whatsoever to do God's work in our lives. Only when we are led by the Spirit of God do we have the desire to seek something greater than ourselves, to live for the kingdom of God. When we have the Holy Spirit leading us, then we can truly have the hope that we desire. What is all of this saying to us? I believe God is telling us to hope in Him. Hope in the Holy Spirit. Let us hope in the power of the Holy Spirit through a very, very specific method, which is prayer. We can hope in the Holy Spirit. We can desire the Spirit. And the way to do that is specifically praying for that very thing. I'm not talking about just, you know, your meal prayers when you thank God for the daily bread that God has provided you. I'm talking about a quality time with God, with the Holy Spirit saying, Holy Spirit, I need your, your leading. I need you to lead me and empower me. I seek your help. I hope in you. That desire is what we can ask for and what we can have. Because the Holy Spirit is the one not only who can help us, but He is the one who wants to lead us and wants to help us. As this verse says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. And uh, let's read this verse together to remind ourselves what the Holy Spirit does. Ready, go. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So it's so true. Indeed, we are weak. And God knows that we are weak. Although we are Christians, although we are even baptized, God knows that we don't have much desire to live holy lives. And so that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Spirit of God does. He helps us to pray. We don't even know what to pray for. We have no desire. But Holy Spirit gives us the, the direction of our prayers. He even prays, intercedes for us in a spiritual language that He and the Father understand on behalf of us. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He is the advocate. He is the true helper. I want to share one secret to uh, you know, church ministries because you probably won't know because you haven't been a pastor yet. <laughs> None of you have uh, done a, a church here in the Bay Area. 
You know, life here in the Bay Area is tough, right? A lot of competition, a lot of changes, and more, you know, changes than the four seasons that we experience during the year. And your work is very competitive, I believe. And so is ministry. You know, there are a lot of uh, seasons in ministry. People come and go, and um, not only the seasons, every day, you know, there's something to celebrate, and there's something to really be concerned and pray for each day. There is no expectation. We cannot expect what will happen tomorrow. It's so exciting to be in ministry, right? And uh, it all comes down to leadership. You know, as a pastor, you might think, you know, pastor knows it all. He's, he knows the Bible and stuff. But, you know, you have to make the decisions and, and exert leadership. And I don't know which direction to go. And even church seems hopeless. You know, we'll be able to gather next week and worship God. It is hopeless sometimes. It feel like that. When, when we, I get these uh, human thoughts, fleshy thoughts, there's only, only always one thing that I can always resort to. But maybe it's the only thing that I can do. Maybe it's the only thing that you can do. And it is prayer. Prayer to God. If the Holy Spirit does not exist, you and I would have been finished a long time ago. But when we close our eyes and when we quieten our hearts and minds and listen to the one who dwells in us, the one who has raised Jesus from the dead, the one who can animate dead bones and make them into an army, when we listen to him, when we listen to what he says, the reminding word of God that he uh, recalls in our minds, he gives us strength. He gives me strength each morning. When I'm downcast, what hope is there today? And he tells me, I am your hope. I will make a way in the desert. I will make dry bones live. When we hear his voice, when we rely upon him, he gives us fresh strength each day to wake up and to take on the day as people of God. Can you show us our last picture there? And you've probably been there, I guess, right? Land's End over there. Uh, you know, um, and uh, it's a labyrinth. It's a maze. It feels like that sometimes each morning. Which way should I go? What should be my choice each day? The only way to navigate a labyrinth like this, if you don't have the entire picture from above, is when somebody leads you hand, uh, close your hands and lead you through the labyrinth. Who knows the, the maze? Only that person can lead us. If all our other strings are broken and if everything else fails, and they will fail, by the way, we hold on to the leading of the Holy Spirit like our prayer is for this year. As we are led by the Spirit, He will lead us to the path of life. He will lead us to the path of strength. He will lead us to the path of resurrection. And I pray that all of us would live a life of resurrection life. To find hope in the most hopeless places because He is our hope. Because He is the, the God of resurrection who makes dry bone live. And let this word be true in all of our lives. Amen. Let's pray.